Imaginations are the origin of all action and behavior. Imagination is the instrument used by scientists, artists, inventors, architects, and mystics alike. It refers to a disciplined, controlled, and purposeful imagination. To imagine something means to mentally design something in order to imprint from the subconscious what is imprinted in the subconscious. What is imprinted on the subconscious mind is expressed on the three-dimensional plane as form, function, experience, and experience. If you want to be successful, you must first see yourself as successful. If you want to be wealthy, you need to see yourself wealthy. Controlled imagination is one of the basic human abilities. With its help, you can work out and design your ideas and help them to become visible on a spatial level. The spiritually awake person knows the power of controlled imagination. The older we get, the more we gain wisdom and learn about spiritual laws. Growing older does not mean that the years pass. It means the beginning of wisdom. When others say, that's impossible, you can't do that, the imaginative person says, it's already like that. Imagination can take us into the depths of reality and reveal the secrets of nature. A businessman once told me how he had started a small store. He said, I dreamed of a big company with branches all over the country. He added that he regularly and systematically envisioned large buildings, offices, factories and retail outlets. And knowing the alchemy of the mind, he knew that he could live the fabric with which his dreams would be clothed. He became successful, and through the universal law of attraction, he gradually attracted the ideas, the staff, the joy, the money, and everything else he needed to realize his ideal, just like a seed dying in the ground. Through its own wisdom, it passes on its energy to another form of itself. From the earth, it extracts everything it needs for its development. As soon as it emerges from the earth through the process of photosynthesis, it draws from the air and from the sun's rays everything it needs to thrive. This man actively used and nurtured his imagination and lived with these mental guidelines until his imagination clothed them in visible form. I particularly liked the following outburst from him. It is just as easy to imagine successfully as it is to imagine unsuccessfully, and it is much more interesting. People who have aspirations, visions and ideals assume that there is a creative force that responds to these visions. Our imaginings are built through feeling. It is rightly said that all our senses are just variants of feeling. Judge Thomas Troward a 19th century English psychologist who wrote unique books on the laws of the mind, said, Feeling is the law, the law is feeling. Feeling is the foundation, the power. We have to feel our way into our imaginations, only then will we get results. Perhaps you have a dream, an ideal, a plan, a project that you want to realize. But friends, colleagues and other people tell you that it can't be done. Perhaps you even say to yourself, who do you think you are? You can't do it. You don't have the right relationships. Well, you already have these relationships. The right contact person is the presence of God within you, which gave you this idea. The same presence of God can also realize it in divine order through divine love. You may have other thoughts that make fun of your plan or ambition. Resistance arises. To dissolve the mental resistance, withdraw your attention from the sensory impressions and the appearance of things, and from now on think clearly and with interest about the goal you have already achieved. When your consciousness is focused on a goal, you use the creative mental principle and your goal will be realized. Raise your goal in consciousness, elevate it, give yourself to it completely, praise it, Devote your attention, love and dedication to your goal. Over time, anxious thoughts will give way to your exalted state of mind. They will weaken and disappear from your mind. The ability to vividly imagine the realized end result gives you control over every circumstance and situation. 
If you want to realize a wish, a desire, an idea, or a plan, keep an image of the realized end result in your mind's eye. Always keep the realization of your wish in the back of your mind. In this way, you will inevitably bring it about. What you imagine is already a reality on the four-dimensional level. If you remain true to your ideal, it will manifest itself one day. The chief architect in you will project what you have imprinted on your subconscious onto the screen of visibility. He talked about the humble beginnings of his career. He did get smaller roles, but then he learned the possibilities of his subconscious. Every night he played out the role he wanted to embody in his imagination. He practiced it over and over again for 15 minutes every night and praised the power of the All Spirit within him. He created a template in his subconscious, and since it could not do otherwise, he reached the pinnacle of his profession. For 15 minutes every night, he regularly and systematically played this inner movie. He was a master of imagination and could see a premiere in his mind's eye. He knew that the almighty spiritual power would support him, and that's exactly what happened. Your imagination paves the way. It is the precursor to what you experience and realize. A young, very successful actress told me that she plays herself into a video every night by dramatizing a certain role. She plays this inner movie over and over again and relives it in her mind for five or six minutes every night. In this way, she builds the foundation for her dreams. There is nothing wrong with castles in the air, but make sure that they rest on a firm foundation. This mental movie paid off. Robin Wright, a member of my broadcast team, recently won a drag race. He said he was hyping himself up before the acceleration race. He imagined his brother congratulating him. He saw himself as a winner and imagined his friends congratulating him. He felt a higher power guiding him in the race. Something had come over him. This supernatural power reacted to the image of victory and winning. Those who constantly put their foot in their mouth carry an image of failure within them. Imagination is a double-edged sword. The self-image of the chronically ill and complaining person is characterized by illness and weakness. When you imagine illness or failure, the subconscious mind ensures that it is realized. Think of yourself as successful. You were born to win. Alcoholics know that the more they try to give up alcohol by willpower or coercion, the greater their urge to drink. Mental coercion, compulsion and willpower will never get you where you want to go. But if you assume sobriety and balance, feel free and imagine yourself back at work doing the work you enjoy. Knowing that an almighty force is supporting your imagination, you will free yourself from the habit and be cured. Walt Whitman had an extraordinary gift of imagination. When the fog shrouded the valleys, he said, he gazed at the mountain peaks. And when the mountain disappeared into the darkness, he turned his gaze to the stars. Imagination can lift you up to bright heights or take you down to the darkest depths. Look beyond the fog of doubt, fear and anxiety to the vision of spiritual reality. A vision is something you look at and contemplate, something you focus your attention on and resolve to go there in life. You look at the mountaintop and say to yourself, that's where I want to go, and that is where you will go. But if you say, I'm old, I'm getting blisters, it's too strenuous for me, you will never reach the top of the mountain. But if the summit is your vision, you will get there. The invisible presence within you will guide you and support you in the realization of your dream. As you journey through life, however arduous it may be, remember that within you is a sacred place, the sanctuary of God, where you feel a kinship with the one who dwells in the hearts of all people for all time. Through the power of imagination, you can bring the flower of love and beauty to bloom. Imagination is the workshop of God. A workshop is a place where raw materials are transformed, processed, and made into useful objects and instruments. Similarly, the human imagination is our workshop 
where ideas, beliefs and concepts are transformed and shaped into living conditions, circumstances and events in our lives. We become the image of our imaginations and we achieve, attain, possess and experience what corresponds to these inner images. Let us briefly consider that everything we see and find useful in our everyday lives originated in the imaginary world of men and women. The clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the chairs we sit on, the buildings we meet in, the houses, hotels, roads and airplanes, all this and much more was first created in the imagination of men. Even the great paintings and statues are products of inspired imagination, the ideals that take people further higher and towards God have their origins in the human imagination. Where is the graceful Madonna dreamed of, on the three-dimensional plane or on the canvas? Does she not first exist in the intellectual imagination of the disciplined artist? In the heyday of classical Greece 2600 years ago or more, the ancient Greeks made use of the law of mind and imagination they knew the power of disciplined, controlled imagination, the workshop of the infinite, and pregnant women used it. They surrounded themselves with beautiful paintings and sculptures so that their unborn children would absorb images of health, beauty, symmetry, order and proportion through the mental influence of the expectant mother. Because the women allowed beautiful statues and other objects to influence them, the child was born as an image of beauty, order, symmetry and proportion. That's easy to understand, isn't it? Of course it is simple. All great truths are simple. There is an old fable about a Persian prince who had a crooked back and could not stand upright. He commissioned a skilled sculptor to make a truthful statue of the prince, but with one crucial difference. I want this statue to show my back as straight as an arrow, I want to see myself as I want to be and as God wants me to be, he ordered. When the statue was finished, he said, put it in a secret place in the garden. The sculptor did as he was told, and day after day the prince came to this spot two or three times regularly and systematically. He looked at the statue longingly, trusting that one day his back would look like the statue's. He concentrated on the arrow straight back, the raised head and the beautiful forehead. Weeks passed, then months, and finally two years, and people began to whisper, the prince's back is no longer crooked at all, he stands upright like a nobleman. And the prince went into the garden, the fable continues, and lo and behold, his back was as straight as the statue. Beautiful. He looked at it and contemplated his ideal image of a straight back. As soon as you imagine that you are now the way you want to be, miracles will happen. Play the role mentally over and over again and you will become exactly the same. In order to receive, you must first imagine or visualize the reality of the fulfilled desired image. A few years ago, I met a young man who had been drafted into the army and was lamenting that his plan to become a doctor had now been thwarted. I told him, Imagine that you are a doctor. See the end state. You have a diploma from an excellent medical school showing that you are now a doctor and a surgeon. Look at it. Go mentally to the end, where you also use the laws of the mind. Within five minutes, and having completed the preparatory medical course, he understood them. He began to implement these recommendations. Some time later, the army sent him to a medical academy and today he is a doctor. He had the desired end situation in mind. If you feel your way into the end scenario, the means for its realization will inevitably bend to your imagination. We know from archaeologists, paleontologists and other experts who study the lives of prehistoric cave dwellers that the wild animals, fish, chickens or mammoths carved into the cave walls show what these dwellers wanted to hunt. Why did they do this? They instinctively knew that a power would bring them these fish or animals so that they could eat what they had imagined. Primitively, but intuitively, 
they knew the laws of the mind, and these things then happened inevitably. The painted animal showed itself, and they had food. That is the power of imagination. This power is within you. Of course, there are more who misuse the power of imagination. I am thinking of a successful and wealthy businessman who imagines empty shelves, sees himself already poor, and indulges in such fantasies. If he doesn't stop doing this, he could of course go bankrupt, even if his business is now flourishing. His fantasies are completely unfounded, but in his head he is playing a movie in which he sees himself as bankrupt, with empty shelves, no customers and the like. If you maintain such a mental movie, this inner movie will come true. Of course you can imagine illness, you can imagine failure, and you can abuse any power, but such behavior is stupid. Figuratively speaking, a coat is something that covers you. You can put on the cloak of fear, or the cloak of faith or confidence, love and benevolence. You can wear a beautiful coat. In material terms, you wear clothes that are appropriate for a certain occasion. If you do sport, dress in a certain way. For work, you choose professional clothing, and when you go to the opera or a banquet, you opt for a more elegant outfit. So much for physical clothing. But we also wear mental clothing. These are our prevailing attitudes, moods and feelings. We have the ability to dress any idea in form. We can imagine anything. We can imagine something wonderful and pleasant. We can imagine a poor friend living like God in France. We can see inside how his face lights up with joy, how his expression changes, how a broad smile comes over his lips. We can hear inside what we want to hear. We can see him exactly as we want to see him, beaming with joy, prosperous and successful. The imagination can clothe and objectify every idea and every wish in form. It can see abundance where there is scarcity. It can sow peace and widen discord. It can see health where there is illness. Imagination is the fundamental faculty of man and takes precedence over all other mental faculties. Man has many faculties, but the imagination used in a disciplined way can make time and space disappear and overcome all limitations. If we keep the imagination busy with lofty, godlike concepts and ideas, it will prove to be the most effective of all faculties in spiritual advancement. Imagination governs the entire realm of embodiment. Regardless of the type of prison we find ourselves in, we can imagine freedom. Imagine that you are back with your loved ones. Perhaps it is a prison of fears, illnesses, lack or other restrictions. You can imagine your freedom and hold on to these imaginings until they are realized. Then, after a period of incubation, which takes place in the dark, the fulfillment of the wish will appear and your prayer will be answered. Someone is playing soccer and hurts an ankle, pulls a tendon or something else. He is taken to the hospital. Doesn't he imagine himself back on the playground kicking the ball again? If he didn't, he would still be in hospital. He wouldn't get out at all. The reason he gets discharged again is because he says to himself, I'm going to stay here for four or five days, maybe a week. And in his mind, he already sees himself back on the playground. You know very well that this is the case. He wouldn't come out of hospital at all if he didn't imagine that. I fully acknowledge that there are people who prefer to stay ill. They wallow in their suffering because it gets them attention, so they should want to get better. Of course they should. God's idea for you is that you express yourself at the highest possible level, that you grow into your highest self. Yes, there are countless people in this world who don't want healing at all. These people talk about it all the time, they complain about my rheumatism, and then gently pat themselves on the thighs, or they moan about their aching limbs, their migraines and so on. Let's take a quick look at a specialty, let's say an architect. He can dream up a beautiful modern building with all the trimmings, long distance roads, swimming pools, an aquarium, green spaces and so on. In his head, he creates the most magnificent palace you have ever seen. 
He can see the fully completed complex in his mind's eye before he presents his plans to the building contractors. Where was this building complex all this time? It was in his imagination. When you imagine something, you conceptualize it. You create a preview. Whatever you conceive, whatever you imagine, is conceived. The subconscious is fertilized, as it were, with the imagined image, the ideal, and the invisible things are made clearly visible. The soul, as the sages of antiquity tell us, can see the invisible things in its mind. Where is the invention now? Is it not in your consciousness? In another spiritual dimension, it already has form, shape, and substance. Believe that you have it now, and you will receive it. With the help of your imagination, you can even hear your mother's voice, even if she is 10,000 miles away. Mentally and spiritually, she is right in front of you, telling you what you wanted to hear. After all, we are all spiritual beings. Of course she is here, telling you what you long to hear. What did you want to hear so much? She is telling you about the miracle of God that is taking place in your life. She tells you how vital she feels and how she is bubbling over with enthusiasm. She tells you what you have been longing to hear. You are happy to hear this. You can see her as clearly as if she were standing in front of you in the flesh. This is the wonderful ability you possess. You know very well that you are capable of this. You can develop and cultivate it, and you can become successful and prosperous. Divine love heals you. Love watches over you. Divine love dissolves everything that does not correspond to this love. Divine love guides the doctors and nurses and all others who take care of you. These should be your affirmations. Your affirmation must be in harmony with your mental image. Your inner image must coincide with your affirmation, and your affirmation must harmonize with your image. That is why you do not see it in the clinic. She is right in front of you and tells you, A miracle of God has happened. Her healing is taking place in a miraculous way. She is being touched by the Almighty. You should imagine that. This is the only way to pray effectively, and then you will understand the laws of the Spirit and apply them correctly. But if you affirm something specific and imagine the opposite, you are a hypocrite. In this case, the results will not materialize because your imagination must match your affirmation. This is the simplest thing in the world. I've often said that 99% of people don't know what praying really means. Sure, wonderful prayers are recited, but these people see the father, mother or son in the prison cell or hospital or elsewhere where their imagination is misguided. Haven't you also heard from a sales manager that he had to dismiss John because his attitude wasn't right? Yes, it's about mindset. A different attitude changes everything. In the business world, they know the importance of the right attitude. Your mental attitude determines your mental reaction to people, circumstances, conditions, or objects. What is your attitude towards your colleagues? Are you nice to people? Are you friendly to animals, to the universe in general? Or do you consider the universe to be hostile? Do you think the world owes you something? In short, what is your attitude? God guides you through your attitude. Then you are behaving correctly, radiating love, peace and goodwill to everyone. The more you change your attitude, the more you change your entire universe. All the stages in your life will magically conform to the template and image of your attitude. Pay attention to the feeling that comes up in you when you imagine, for example, that someone is mean, dishonest and jealous. Now turn the tables. Imagine that the same person is honest, loving and kind. Pay attention to the reaction that now arises in you. Do you now realize that you are in control of your attitude? All this boils down to the fact that your image of God determines your attitude to life in general. Suppose the teacher says that your boy is not keeping up at school, has learning difficulties or something similar. Your offspring is finding it difficult to learn. Let's also assume that you are the mother. What do you do now? 
If you know about the spiritual laws and how the subconscious mind works, relax on a chair or sofa. First, relax physically. You become calm. Say to yourself, my toes are relaxed, my feet are relaxed, my stomach muscles are relaxed, my heart and lungs are relaxed, my spine is relaxed, my neck is relaxed, my arms are relaxed, my eyes are relaxed, I am completely relaxed from head to toe. Once you are relaxed, your body must obey you. If you are relaxed and faithful, your prayer will be answered. Without relaxation, the results will not come. Relax and believe in fulfillment. From this point on, omnipotence begins to work, and physical relaxation is followed by spiritual relaxation. You become inwardly calm and balanced. So what are you going to do with the boy in the example described? The following. Imagine that your son is standing in front of you and little Tommy is saying to you, Mum, you know, I'm getting straight A's now. The teacher even congratulated me. And you would realize that the infinite intelligence in the boy has risen. The wisdom of God has anointed his mind. He is happy, joyful and free. God dwells in him and lives in him. The boy tells you what you as his mother want to hear. The teacher has praised me. I'm getting good marks in all my subjects. You would call up this inner video again and again, and in this way awaken the wisdom and intelligence of God sleeping in the boy. They are there, and the mother can activate them. Of course she can. What is that? It is disciplined imagination. The boy will objectively confirm to you what he has told you in this passive, receptive state. It's as simple as the ABCs. We are talking about a disciplined, controlled and goal-oriented imagination. We use the laws of the mind. This approach works. The modern scientist knows that your dominant idea of God is also your idea of life, because God is life. If your predominant idea is that God is the spiritual power within you which responds to your thoughts, and this power, because your beliefs and way of thinking are uplifting and harmonious, guides and directs you, and leads you in every way for the good, then this predominant idea will mirror everything that happens to you in the world through this positive attitude of mind, and you will joyfully come out of the best. A good example of how one man's imagination created one of the most successful companies is Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks. For a new idea to succeed, it requires vision, steadfastness, and unwavering confidence. Mr. Schultz was recruited by Starbucks to work in retail sales and marketing. At the time, Starbucks was a mid-sized coffee retailer with only a few outlets in Seattle. Schultz was 29 years old and newly married. The couple moved from New York City to Seattle and Schultz accepted the job. About a year later, Schultz went on a shopping trip to Italy. In Milan, he realized how important coffee was to Italian social life. A working day typically began with a cup of coffee in a cafe. After work, friends and colleagues would meet again for a coffee before heading home. Coffee is at the heart of Italian conviviality. Schultz imagined such cafes in America. It was a novelty, but because of the excellent quality of Starbucks coffee, he thought it would work. Schultz envisioned hundreds of such coffee houses all over America. These were places that were frequented by business people and where people would meet to relax after work. Store visitors would go there for refreshments. Young people would meet for a rendezvous in a coffee house instead of a cocktail bar. Friends would drop in before or after going to the movies. All his thinking revolved around this idea. He was determined to set up a nationwide chain of cafes modeled on Italian coffee houses. But the Starbucks owners were reluctant. Their main business was the wholesale of coffee beans. The restaurants they ran made up only a small part of their business. In order to realize his plans, Schultz left the Starbucks company and founded his own company. In 1986, he opened his first coffee house in Seattle. It was a success right from the start. Schultz soon opened another in Seattle and then a third in Vancouver. A year later, 
he bought the Starbucks company and adopted its name for his business. Schultz believed that the quality of Starbucks would one day change the way Americans lived. He envisioned that a cup of Starbucks coffee would become an integral part of American culture. His concept paid off. Starbucks sales have doubled every year since 1988. Nine or three years in a row, Starbucks made a loss. Over a million dollars in 1989 alone, but Schultz never gave up. He was convinced that he was on the right track and that the losses would soon give way to profits. As soon as the coffee houses in Seattle were in the profit zone, they were gradually opened in other cities too, in Vancouver, Portland, Los Angeles, Denver, Chicago, and later also in the eastern cities of the USA and other countries. The name Starbucks has become a household name around the world and a symbol of American marketing savvy, making Howard Schultz one of the richest people in the world. Some have a bleak and despondent outlook on life. They are bitter, cynical and sullen. The cause is their prevailing mindset, which determines their reactions to everything. Even if they or their loved ones have experienced something wonderful, their joy will usually be short-lived because they are constantly moping. A 16-year-old high school student once said to me, I get very bad grades, my memory is weak, I don't know why. There was only one reason for this, his attitude. When he realized how important his performance was as a prerequisite for attending college to study law, he changed his mental attitude. This young man realized that there was a spiritual power within him and that this power was the only cause. Furthermore, he assumed that his memory would function perfectly and that the infinite intelligence would show him everything he needed to know when required. He began to show goodwill to teachers and classmates everywhere, which is very important. This young man now enjoyed greater freedom than he had all those years before. He kept imagining the teachers and his mother congratulating him on his outstanding achievements and report cards. As he visualized the results he wanted, his attitude towards his studies changed. If you visualize yourself being successful at what you love to do, if you maintain this visualization regularly and systematically, and if you do not deny what you visualize, success is assured. You can't help but succeed because the law of the mind is behind you. We have already said that all beliefs are shaped by the power of imagination. You have also learned that you can use your imagination in two ways. This also applies to your thoughts. You can use every force in nature in two different ways. Both the laws of navigation and the laws of chemistry are absolutely reliable. You can combine chemicals in such a way that mankind experiences a benefit, or you can play around in the laboratory without a clue about the laws of attraction, repulsion, or atomic mass, and blow everything up. You can imagine that today is going to be a bad day for you. Business will be bad. It will rain. No one will come to the store today. People have no money. In this case, you will experience the content of your imagination. A woman called me. She had tried to sell a house that had been left to her by her father. The property was worth half a million dollars. I'm widowed and alone. I want to sell this property, but who has that kind of money these days? People look at it and then disappear never to be seen again. I said, proceed as follows. Stop this nonsense. Walk through your house in your imagination and show it to an imaginary buyer, a buyer who exists in your imagination. Show him the whole layout, the garage and everything else, and imagine him saying to you, yes, I like it, I'll take it, and then he hands you a check. I said, it's all in your imagination. You're happy about it, and you take the check to the bank. The bank clerk says to you, congratulations, you've sold your house. You play the whole thing out mentally. You show him around, and the prospective buyer is delighted and tells you, I'll take it. You visualize everything, then you let it go because you are selling it mentally. Unless you sell it mentally first, you'll never sell it because there's a transaction going on in your mind. You can only win or lose if it happens mentally first. All transactions take place mentally. That's the be-all and end-all. 
Sometimes it is very difficult to understand the way people think. These connections are so simple. If you can't make them clear to a seven-year-old, then you haven't understood them, because if you have understood it, you can explain it to that child. You can only sell a house if there is someone who has the money to buy it. But if you ask yourself, who has a million dollars today? Money is tight, mortgage rates are high, and the like, then you've already lost before you start. But there are people who have millions. There are many millionaires. You can only sell this house if someone wants it. That's point one. Infinite intelligence knows where that person is. That's point two, which means that infinite intelligence attracts the buyer who wants this house to me. This buyer appreciates it, feels comfortable in it, and has the money to buy it. Next, forget about all the people who don't have a centime and just want to look at the house. After all, you are not organizing tourist tours. You should therefore stipulate that only people who have the money to buy the house will come. You show your property to this group of people in your presentation. You show it to the buyer. He is satisfied. In your visualization, you show them everything that you should and will show them in reality. And then the sale is perfect. That's how it will happen. That's the next way to sell your property. Troward once went for a walk in London. He imagined he saw a snake. Fear gripped him and he was half paralyzed. What he had seen looked like a snake. There are no snakes on London's streets, but Troward had the same mental and emotional reaction as if he had seen one. The Bible tells us what we should imagine. All that is true, all that is honorable, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, all that is comely, if there is any virtue, and if there is any praise, consider. Think of such things and imagine. What are you doing with your life? Are you creating a happy life, or is it a life full of frustrations? You shape and form your outer world according to the inner guidelines that you predominantly hold in your consciousness. Imagine circumstances and conditions that dignify and elevate your life circumstances that please and satisfy you. Imagine your spouse telling you what you so eagerly wanted to hear. Yes, sit down in silence, close your eyes, and then open them again. In the story by Washington Irving, the farmer Rip Van Winkle fell into a magical sleep and only woke up again after 20 years, only to discover that he was no longer a subject of the English king. Go into silence. Fix your attention and relax. As long as you do not relax, the results will not come. As soon as you relax and believe in the fulfillment of your wish, your prayer will be answered. If you do not relax, you will not believe. It's as simple as that. Stop fooling yourself. Relax, let go and listen to your life partner tell you what you so desperately wanted to hear. He says, I love you. I think you're wonderful. He tells you that he has been promoted. He's doing the job he likes. He tells you how much he loves you, how important you are to him. You hear how wonderful his life is now and how comfortable he is in his new job. You hear the words you have been longing to hear. Hear them and don't reject them. Then you will also hear in buses what you have heard inside because you have now heard what he should say to you according to the golden rule and the law of love. Let him or her always say inwardly what he or she should say to you according to the law of love and the golden rule. Then it can only succeed. I receive letters from men and women from different states. It's hard to believe. In them I read, I want this woman to marry me. She ignores me. Can you tell me how I should pray to get her? It has nothing to do with praying. I write back and explain to these people that I can't think of a man in the whole world who is sane and wants a woman by his side who doesn't want to know anything about him. I don't beat around the bush. The same goes for women. I can't imagine a woman wanting a man who doesn't want to know anything about her. To me, that's pathological. Love is based on reciprocity. When you love, there is a natural reciprocity. Then there is no confusion. One woman said, 
I'm crazy about John Jones. I asked her, how does John treat you? What has he said to you? Did he propose to you? Did he offer you a ring? Did he tell you, I've ordered a posse for November 10th or anything like that? No, she said. He smiled at me and he's nice to me. Good God in heaven. This is why I say so often that Rip Van Winkle slept for 20 years. If you're in love, the other person must be in love with you too. It's mutual. Love is a state of being. We must send love and show love and wish them peace, goodwill and all the blessings of life. Otherwise we will get into great difficulties. So in that sense, we must love everyone and wish for everyone what we wish for ourselves. But don't force it. Forcing another person to marry you is black magic. It will fall back on you. That is simply disgusting. If life is physically hard, cruel and bitter, fights and pain are inevitable. Then you are ruining your own life because these are your images. Imagine yourself on the golf course. You feel free, relaxed, full of enthusiasm and energy. Your joy overcomes all the difficulties that the golf course presents you with. The excitement removes all obstacles. If you know the laws of the mind, if you no longer live in the dark ages, if you are no longer hypnotized and brainwashed, you can rejoice in the new birthday of man in the chapel of the dead. You can imagine your loved one surrounded by their friends in the next dimension of life amidst indescribable beauty. You can imagine the stream of God flowing through the consciousness and hearts of everyone present. You can make everyone present rejoice because it is a new birthday with God. At some modern funerals, there is no body present. The daughter or son arranges a memorial service for their mother or father, and all the relatives come together to honor the new birthday with God. That makes sense. It is wonderful to see how more and more people are recognizing these truths these days. No one is buried anywhere, and as long as you believe that someone is buried somewhere, you assume an end and a limitation. You have built the graveyard in your own mind. You are certainly aware of the terrible and negative results of such a way of thinking. A teacher, a relative of mine, was exploring the towers of Ireland. I accompanied him. For an hour he didn't say a word. He remained passive and relaxed and seemed lost in thought. I asked him what was going through his mind. He explained to me that we only grow and develop as human beings by thinking about the wonderful ideas in the world. He contemplated the age of the stones of the tower. Then his imagination took him back to the quarries where they were carved into shape. His imagination dissected the stones. Inwardly, he saw the structure, the geological formation and composition, and reduced everything to its formless state. Finally, he imagined the unity of the stones with all the stones and with all life and the whole world. There is only one single entity. In this state of mental contemplation, he discovered that the history of the Irish people could be reconstructed simply by looking at a round tower. This is absolutely the case. There is only one consciousness, one law, one life, one truth. In the stones of the round tower, we find the memory of the people. Why? It is subjective, not solid. It is alive. The stone is alive. There is nothing dead in the universe. This stone, which is called lifeless matter, is alive. With the help of his imagination, this teacher could see the invisible souls who had lived in these round towers and hear their voices. In his imagination, the whole place came to life. His imagination allowed him to travel back in time to a time when there was no round tower on this site. He mentally constructed a drama of the place where the stones came from. Who transported them? What was the purpose of the building and what history was associated with it? He also told me, I can almost feel the touch, hear the footsteps that echoed here thousands of years ago. Where does a novel or a poem come from? What is the origin of human history? The subjective spirit permeates everything. It is in all things and is the stuff of which everything is made. The treasury of eternity is in the building blocks of a building. 
there is nothing inanimate. All of life is a manifold manifestation. Your imagination enables you to uncover the invisible secrets of nature. You will realize that you can plumb the depths of consciousness that calls that which is not to be and makes the invisible visible. Basically, all religions stem from the inventive human imagination. Our television, radio, radar, jet airplanes and other modern inventions not the result of imagination. Your imagination is the treasury of infinity which gives you all the precious jewels and music, art, poems and inventions. You can look at some ancient ruins, an old temple or a pyramid and reconstruct the dead history. The ruins of old churchyards allow you to relive the modern city in all its beauty and glory. You may find yourself in a dungeon of hardship, adversity, or behind bars. But in your imagination, you can find an unimagined amount of freedom. I can see now how Shakespeare listened to the old stories, fables, and myths of his time. I can also imagine how he sat down to mentally arrange all these characters, then put them on paper and give them skin, muscle and bone, and finally animate them so vividly that we feel we are reading about ourselves. Shakespeare's stories are about you. All the characters are inside you. Use your imagination to be in what your father is. Spiritually imagine a story based on the golden rule and the law of love. For faith becomes active through love, and faith moves mountains. But without faith you won't get very far, and love is warmth, kindness, and goodwill towards all people to whom you wish all the blessings of life. Look at the story you are writing and the characters in it with your spiritual eyes, and go through it with your strong artistic mindset. Your article will make fascinating reading and will be extremely interesting for the readership. Yes, the wonderful power of imagination resides within you. It would be very welcome if each of us would review our perceptions from time to time and put our beliefs and views to the test. Ask yourself, why do I believe this? Where does this view come from? Many of your views, theories, beliefs and opinions may be wrong and have been accepted unquestioningly. Geologists and paleontologists who study the tombs of ancient Egypt use their imagination to reconstruct ancient ruins. The dead past becomes alive and audible again. Using the ruins and hieroglyphics, the scientists can determine the age of a time when there was no language. Communication took place through grunts and gestures because there was a time when man had no language. It is imagination that enables scientists to put roofs on ancient temples and surround them with gardens, ponds and fountains. The fossils are given eyes, tendons and muscles in the imagination and can walk and talk again. The past awakens once again to a living present. In the world of the imagination, there is neither time nor space. With the help of your imagination, you can put yourself in the company of the most brilliant people of all time. God will wipe away all tears from your eyes. You can succeed in anything you tackle. You can overcome adversity, poverty and failure. You are only destined for success and prosperity. In short, if you want to be successful, you must first see yourself successful. If you want to be prosperous, you must see yourself prosperous. When others say, that's impossible, it can't be done, the person blessed with imagination says, it already is. Imagination penetrates into the depths of reality and reveals the secrets of nature. The ability to envision the end result allows you to control any circumstance or condition in life. If you want to realize a certain wish, idea or plan, Create an image of the already fulfilled wish or realized plan. Keep the fulfillment of your wish constantly alive. In this way, you will condense it into a reality. Your imagination can bring about the realization of any idea or wish. You can imagine prosperity where there has been scarcity. You can imagine peace where there is discord and you can imagine health where there is illness. Whatever you imagine, you can bring about. 
You do this by imprinting the realized wish image on your subconscious. The soul can see invisible things in your subconscious. Where is the fulfillment of your current heart's desire? In your subconscious. That is where this fulfillment is. There, on this other spiritual level, it has shape, form and substance. Believe that your wish has already been fulfilled and you will experience it. Your imagination is the key to realizing your goals.